For the newly indoctrinated, Jim Butcher's The Dresden Files follows the story of a professional wizard in Chicago. We started our podcast as a way to help break down the series' most important moments, characters, and lore. This is McAnally's Dresden Files podcast by Free Flow Rambling. Conjure at it by your own risk. Welcome to the McAnally's podcast brought to you by Free Flow Rambling. This is episode 5.5, Not for Sale. My name is Tanzan and I'm joined by Maggie. Hello, hello. And Jess. Hi. This is a special episode because we have Maggie remoting, uh, remotely recording. From it's grand there. old Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Yeah. Prohibition tunnels, here I come. <laughs> <laughs> How is the weather there? Is it uh, nice and hot like it is here? Boiling. Yeah, it is over 30 degrees Celsius here. Brutal. So what is that up in the 90s or 100s or something? Uh, I think so. 90s at least, I think, yeah. Have so to do it's, the... it's, it's very warm. Thank God for air conditioning. Thank you to our Patreon subscribers for your generous support. It's people like you who help us do what we do. If you're not yet a Patreon subscriber, sign up today and get a fuck ton of bonus content, kick-ass merch, behind-the-scenes outtakes, and more. Sign up today at patreon.com slash freeflowrambling. Chapter 10. Gentleman Johnny Marcone has a deal for Dresden to work in an official capacity under Marcone. Dresden refuses to bend his morals and ultimately sends Marcone away, for better or worse. Uh, all right, so so Marcone is sitting at Dresden's desk in his chair. Total power move. Right. With the, with the muscle Hendrick standing behind him, just to add yeah, to that lovely like dynamic. He's like ready to transform into the Hulk. Good old yeah, Hendrix. Yeah, I love that Marvel reference. It's lovely. <laughs> I love that Harry is such a. a- comic book and sci-fi fantasy nerd like the rest of us. Hmm. Um, but yeah, exactly. He walks into his office in his office building and there is Marco. Who's that sitting in my chair? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so, yeah. I really enjoy what a bitch Marco is in this. Because <laughs> right yes. off the bat, Dresden's all like, you're in my office. He's like, treat me with respect. You're in my office. Treat me with respect. (laughs) You broke into my office, man. And and he even, like, rebuffs Dresden for being childish at one point. Yeah, like, he didn't, like, we already established in the last episode that we assume Marcone has been sitting here all day waiting for (laughs) Harry to show up. (laughs) His network is just that good. Okay, he's coming, he's coming, quick, go now. Or was stalking Harry all day, and then be like, okay, run to the office, go, go, go. Which honestly sounds more Marcone's type. Either way, that's childish. <laughs> no, that's prepared Business, Mr. Dresden. Business. He's just a boy scout. Always be prepared. Right, so pretty much off the bat, Marcone is offering Harry uh, an NDA, more or less. Pretty much. I will pay you whatever the hell you want to sit down and shut up. <laughs> As yeah, his own little personal non-disclosure agreement, so Harry can be his. I will tell you. Like, well, actually, no, that's not true. I was going to say he doesn't tell him when to work because he leaves it pretty flexible. But where Marcone wants a say, it gives him the authority to have a say in what Harry can or can't do, or say or won't say, and blah blah blah. And oddly enough, Harry kind of says, mm, "Fuck you," <laughs> which is so unlike him. Well, and it was a really sweet deal for him, too. Name his own hours, a five-hour minimum a month. Name if his own that. salary. Salary, yep, yeah, to- by his choosing. Um, and uh, there is also a clause saying that he doesn't have to do anything unlawful. Like, Yeah. <laughs> that's that's yeah. pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah, and Harry considered, I mean, he could, all those little pamphlets by his door, he could have them, like, on glossy paper now instead of just like <laughs> dream big <laughs> want to do magic ask me how which is don't really float um but yeah exactly it's it says he puts it a comfortable color it's a fantastic deal he could do all the magical research he wants to do all the um side projects not 
doing all the crazy, wacky jobs he gets hired to do simply to put food on the table. Yeah. So, yeah. What do, you, what do you think? Would you guys have taken the deal? Oh, man. I... <laughs> I think at 25, you know, I probably would have. I was, just, I was just going to say, it probably would depend on, on what age and stage of my life I was at. At that point, that would have been. But it's it's got a pr- pretty hefty, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Baggage. What's the, I mean, not price tag, because I mean, the price tag is what Mark is offering him, but. Well, no, it comes um, with a heavy price conditions. tag. Conditions. Yeah. Conditions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, well, okay. So, as you said, Harry does pretty much just be like, you know what? No, fuck you. No way in hell am I ever going to work for you. I don't care how good the benefits or the pay or the hours, et cetera, et cetera, are. Uh, and Marcone is very angry and he's like, I will never make this offer again. And I think as we go through the books, you see that Harry's um, goals and morals and priorities drastically, drastically change from this book until what he is in future Marcone meetings. And it's just something um, to consider, you know, what could have been mm. had Harry I, I, made the jump earlier on. Well, not to say that he ever does make the jump, but that he... Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know that I would necessarily say he drastically changes, but events and circumstances, I mean, obviously there are... Um, yeah, his world becomes less black and white even than it is now. Even though there's a lot of gray in there, he still has some black and white. Like you say, he has the ignorance, naivety, the hopefulness of youth and that, you know, good is good, bad is bad. Um, and yes, life has a way of doing that to all of us, of making certain choices and compromises that, you know, either we see other sides to that we wouldn't have without that life experience or... Um, things that have changed in circumstances that have occurred that suddenly push you from, you know, like I no longer have the luxury of not crossing this line or this degree or whatever. Um, well, that's the thing is that he's very hypocritical because when he's sitting in his car at the bottom, in the parking lot of his office, he's saying, okay, well, I don't want to be a killer. I don't want to have to turn to that. But if that's what it comes to, then hell yeah, I'm going to come out on top no matter how many dead bodies it takes. And then he's up here and he's like, fuck working with you, Marcone. Well, Marcone's honestly offering him like a no murder thing. You get basically protection from Marcone. You're not going to be thrown into the scuffle and you make bank doing it. Yeah, but it's, it's, I don't think it's hypocritical at all because it's the, um, it's the side. Harry's talking about like, you know, self-defense or morality or judgment kind of a thing. He'll kill the bad guys to stop them from killing innocent people. Whereas Marcone doesn't have that distinction. Marstinkson, Mar- Marcone deals in drugs and flesh on a regular basis, and that's part of Harry's problem, is Marcone doesn't really care what the consequences and effects of that are, as long as business runs smoothly, his people are loyal to him and nobody steps out of line, and he lines his pockets, right? And he will kill his own guys if they do get out of line, or I mean, you know, yada but yada, blah blah blah, In right? defense of himself, Marcone even brings up and says that, uh... I'm the reason that these streets are not so bad. You know, I'm bringing order to it. It's not and he does, a free-for-all killing spree. No, he's got an iron grip on on the uh, mob commu- on the, the criminal community, but there's still a criminal community, and that's what Harry has a problem with. And Marcone, when it comes to those kinds of choices and lines, doesn't have an issue. So yeah, he, he controls the streets because he will literally get rid of everybody else and they're afraid and they know it and the only difference is Chauncey accuses Harry of the exact same thing in the next chapter is that when it comes to the white council you are walking the line if it you know justification means to the end you will summon demons and you will kill the non-human werewolves blah 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 kind of depends on where his moral line actually lays because it sounds like it's it's a little bit in the gray and flexible. Yeah, and this is where the whole conundrum comes in. That's it. Is That's where Harry's line is not the same place as Marcone's line. Marcone's like, I'll kill a snitch just because he's a snitch. And Harry is like, okay, well, I will kill a murderous, rampaging werewolf, even though sometimes he might be a man, because he's a murdering, rampaging werewolf, and will kill 
dozens, hundreds, whatever of other people that can't defend themselves against it, right? Okay, I'm not technically defending Marcon or saying that Harry should join up with him, but I do think that there's a little bit of that younger moral superiority that is not entirely deserved. And especially because I think, you know, at this point, Harry's kind of only got Marcon as a bad guy. He doesn't have any of the specifications other than he's big bad guy. Like, what Marcon does in... Mm, other than, you know, knowing some of his businesses or some of his men, he's not nearly as intertwined with the criminal side of Chicago as he will later become. He's not really sure about Marcon's Harry? whole shtick yet. Yeah, Harry. Other than, you know, I understand illegality is happening, and I understand that it's top-tier stuff, and I'm sure even Murphy has let slip a thing or two, you know? But at the end of the day, it's not like he's like... You know, Marcon's not at the level that he will become either yet. And I think Harry's... Not that he should have taken the deal, but still almost jumping the gun and being like, Fuck no, I would never work with you. It's like, alright dramatic yeah i don't know i like i say i get sort of to a point what you're saying too but i mean kind of to go back to the question of would you or wouldn't you like i think again if it was me i was like i damn sure would be tempted i think a slightly different place from where harry is maybe but i was like i don't think i would simply because i wouldn't know enough about it to trust it or whatever you know i would be like yeah this sounds too good i don't know what this or i you know that would be me at that age. I would just be like, yeah, I have a feeling this is just kind of like not really a good deed. So I probably shouldn't get, you know, I mean, be like a drug dealer coming up and being like, hey, you can make millions of dollars. <laughs> and be like, mm, yeah, I could, but I think I'm going to have to pass. Yeah, I, I would, you know, I would question, you know, can this contract change? Because at some point you've got to think like if you count as an employee of Marcones, then maybe it's like. New HR policy rolling out. You've got to kill three <laughs> people a month. Like, Good point. But, you know, it's obviously a gateway. Yeah, well, that Harry did say he of. sort of read over the contract and it looked familiar enough and legit enough. Like, it didn't have the loopholes. But that's my point, is that in this particular case, Harry wasn't being tricked into anything that we can see. Yes, no. And, and I, yeah, I, I guess. I just, I still think... I do sort of get what you're saying, devil's advocate and stuff like that, but I don't really think it is all that hypocritical or whatever. I mean, again, you can't really be hypocritical for things that change 5, 10, 30 years down the road. You know, I mean, if this is his stance here and now, then he's being true to himself here and now. You know, if other things happen, then maybe if he made this same argument 20 years from now, then you could say he's being hypocritical, but... I think in the moment, in the here and the now, without knowing what the future holds and stuff like that is, and, and I understand, I do get where Harry is coming from and where he draws the distinction between the lines that he's willing to cross and the lines that Marcon is willing to cross. So even though murder may be the outcome in both scenarios, it matters to Harry a lot more the, the who's and what's and wherefores and the, the intent. <laughs> Probably because somebody tried to murder him at one point, you know? Uh, yeah, only only <laughs> one at the <laughs> He's like, yeah, I don't like this murder stuff when people try it on me. It sucks. <laughs> so yeah, so so Marcone is all like, well, here, fine, I have some information about what's going on. I'll sell it to you. So first, yeah, he tries to get Harry to come on as like an employee, a, a contractor or whatever. And Harry's like, no. So Marcone's like, okay, fine. Well, I still have some information. I'll sell it to you. And Harry's like, <laughs> No. <laughs> it's like, people are dying and shit, and you might be next, because they're like, you know, your guy and all this kind of stuff, so how about you just tell me what's going on, and if it's useful, I'll make sure, maybe, hopefully, kind of, that you don't die right away. <laughs> so Marcone is eventually like, okay, fine, after trying to weasel his way around that, too, and get Harry. So yeah, so that's where he just drops the name of Harley McFinn in the Northwest Passage Project, and doesn't give Harry anything else to go on. So that's his clue. And then Harry's like, Harry gets real pissed at him and, and, you know, when he leaves. And then he's kind of like, goes through, you know, the whole thing of, of sort of digesting and, and looking at his feelings. And he's like, actually, it's not necessarily hate. It's like anger and disgust at who he is. Which, again, comes back to why he wouldn't take the deal, right? This is, It's who Marcon is and what he represents and what he does that Harry can't. And, and that's really the crux of the problem. It's not even necessarily that he can't hates Marcone, and he does acknowledge that there are some, like, like again, his his methods are cruel, but efficient, right? Like, there is less 
unorganized crime and stuff going on. You know, he has made improvements, but Marcone himself is still pretty ruthless and pretty brutal. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Harry realizes, you know, like, it's all right to be afraid. Like, he is kind of afraid of Marcone when it comes right down to it. And I mean, it's fair, too, because even though he can do terrible, scary things, because he mentions when he first goes in and then Hendrix seems a little twitchy um, when Harry goes, makes whatever movement and stuff like that. And he's like, oh, he's probably, you know, he's like, oh, I remember what happened to the varsity or whatever, right? So it's like, they have a certain respect and fear for Harry. Um, but Harry knows ultimately he can't really do anything to them. But yeah, he can blow the doors off their building. But it's not like Harry can, you know, really go up against them with magic because he can't risk harming or killing them that way, right? Yeah, the White Council would be down his throat. He's already right and hot. So, so yeah, so he has reason to be afraid of, because again... At this point in time, Harry's drawing that line between, you know, just cold-blooded murder and not, you know, so he can try to protect himself against Marcone if Marcone flat out does something. But at the same time, Marcone is a wily businessman with a huge organization under his control. Um, And yeah, Harry is like, you know what, I I am kind of afraid, (laughs) like, this guy could do shit to me or take me out or ruin his reputation. I mean, he, you know, suddenly that's part of it. He's like, I didn't realize how much it was bugging me, you know, until the sort of confrontation meeting here about Marcone spreading the rumor, you know, like at the time, again, it was kind of a convenient way to sweep everything under the rug and not get murdered horribly by a mob boss, but now he's like, I don't like that I'm associated, that people thought I was working for him and and doing his bidding kind of a thing, right? So, you know, he acknowledges that, yeah, he doesn't like him, he's afraid, but... Well, yeah, he deals with it in a very, very human way, like he's got the adrenaline rush and he's realizes the repercussions of having his name associated with Marcone. Uh, he also recognizes that he like faced a narrow death again by just d- trying to piss off Marcone, but yeah. Marcone did- decided that it was business like. The chapter ends with some good good uh, scene setting and foreshadowing, uh, but but to know that the man I knew, the businessman killer, to know that he was frightened of what I was about to go up against, that scared the hell out of me and added an element of intimidation to the work I was doing that hadn't been present before. It's a nice yeah. little, ooh, yeah. If, if um, Gentleman Johnny Marcone is afraid, you should be very afraid as well. <laughs> right, exactly. And while Harry has some, you know, tips and tricks up his sleeves that Marcone doesn't, again, Marcone is very clever, very well prepared, really looks at the big picture, and has a whole fucking organization to to protect him. Right. Harry and still felt the need. person. And still felt the need to throw a bone after all that disrespect. Yes, right, which is, yeah. Hook, line, and sinker, baby. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, (laughs) sits down, (laughs) forcing thoughts of blood and fangs and agonizing death from his mind, and starts looking for the name Harley McFinn and the Northwest Passage Project. And now a word from our sponsor. Come on down to McNally's Pub. Wednesday special, 4.30 to close. Toot toot pizza pizzazz. Recommended by fairies everywhere. Don't forget our nightly special where every night is $6 steak and ale. Featuring Max Wizard Preferred Proprietary Brew. Chapter 11 Dresden summons the demon Chauncey to get more information on McFinn and the Northwest Passage Project. Harry gets more than he bargained for when Chauncey reveals he has information on his mother. Murphy calls Dresden to the next crime scene. So chapter 11. It's a lovely juxtaposition of Chauncey as the screaming demon, and then, and then the next scene of him in the Oxford-educated voice. I love that so much. I like the... <laughs> proper professor with his wire rim spectacles right. and his posh accent. Yes. So, first demon summoning. Well, first demon summoning that we've seen Harry do. We had Kalshazek in the last one with the Shadow Man Victor Cells and Harry's like, what the fuck? You don't just go around summoning demons. However, <laughs> or do you? Apparently <laughs> Harry has just been going around <laughs> summoning demons because Sean Zagaroff, or as he fondly is endearingly referred to as Chauncey, uh, Harry has apparently called him up like a good half a dozen times. And Chauncey even says himself, he's like, not even just once, even though you know the White Council is going to like smack your pee-pee for doing this. He's like, you've called me up not just once, but like half a dozen times. From, from. Now, we don't know the exact time what frame. I don't know if this phrase. is between. It's what? <laughs> what a phrase. 
<laughs> well, yes. Well, that was quite the imagery. And Thank sadly, you. Sadly, I don't often get to use it. I don't get to use it as often as I would like because I'm sure some people would be offended. Um, I'm offended. Take it the wrong way. <laughs> well, it works much better for guys than girls, really. Um, yeah. Either way. If you're going to break the law, you should do it in your basement where no one can see. Not on the streets of Chicago where anyone could be watching. Exactly. So Harry keeps that to his private basement. Wow, this conversation just go all kinds of sideways. It's just you. No, <laughs> I'm working on a road crew right now. What do you expect? <laughs> Not as much highbrow humor as you might think there would be. Oh. Um... Oh, you were going to tell people you were doing a national tour. <laughs> yes, I am on the road doing a national <laughs> tour. That's what I just said. <laughs> look at this sign. Now look at that sign. <laughs> <laughs> I can... Sign, signs, every... <laughs> Clocking up the scenery. Tansen? Uh, yeah. So Justin risked the wrath of the White Council and his own personal safety. Uh, because Bob had no more information to offer, hence the demon summoning. And he does kind of say, like, when Chauncey brings this up and he's like, oh, you're not really supposed to do this, and you're already kind of, like, on the shit side of them right now. And Harry's like, yeah, well, I'm not really breaking the law. Like, I'm not making you do anything or sending you after anything. So he's got him contained in his little summoning circle in his basement lab um, so that he's locked. And, and we start off with, with Chauncey blowing a whole pissy fit, screaming and raging and trying to get out, and you think, oh my god, Harry's catching, like, this massive monster. And then Harry's just like, so, all good? And Chauncey's like, yeah, it's good, it'll hold me in, okay, we can, you know, <laughs> we can move on to business now. He's He has to go through the motions, right? And those motions are, like, the obligatory want to sell me your soul. And Harry's like, no, I don't want to join the dark side. Um, and he's like, well, you know, I have to. And then he's like, so, what, what are we going to do for this? Um, and and we find that the currency here um, are names. Yeah. Capital N names. So Harry's like, yeah, because he's like, well, you're not getting my soul. And Chauncey's like, well, you know, I got to try. And Harry's like, yeah, that's just not going to. So then he's like, how about another of your names? So we've learned that he's given him a couple already over previous. So depending, I'm sure there's been other, because he says half a dozen times he's been called down. So there has to have been other prices and things they've agreed on, I guess, depending on the scope or the information or the, you know, whatever. But a couple of them have apparently been big enough that Harry has already willingly given this demon spawn um, two of his names from his own lips, um, which can, you know, eventually in a way be used against him if, if, if Chauncey gets the whole thing. And so Harry does debate for a while, like, do I want to go as far as giving him three? Because then it's not hard to get the fourth, right? Like, there's not a lot left. We also find out that uh, that Dresden's uh, signing a soul contract with a demon brings big status bonuses for the demon. I guess he's got a big, giant, tasty soul. <laughs> yes, apparently. And we learn a little bit more about maybe why that is towards the end of the chapter as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Demons but kind of work on commission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently this this is Harry's a big fish to 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 bring in this the to, to their side of the the table here or whatever, right? Um, so yeah, I think Harry's a little bit like uh, what? <laughs> but yeah, oddly enough, there's a lot Harry doesn't know yet, and Harry doesn't know he doesn't know it. So right. But yeah, I like how even Chauncey sort of knows and and and. I don't think he's necessarily trying to rub it in. It just kind of comes that way anyways. But he's like, um, uh, when he's talking about, oh yeah, because he's, he's, he, uh, demons. Um, because he's like, you technically you're not supposed to be calling me up. Like the white council wouldn't like it. And, and, and Justin's like, technically he's like, I'm not breaking any of the laws of magic. I'm not robbing you of your will. So I'm clear on the fourth law and you don't get, and if you don't get loose, I'm in the clear on the seventh. Um, so he's like, the council can bite me. And Chauncey's like, I guess, I was, do you mean that's a euphemism? He's <laughs> like, yeah. It's like but, meeting up with your drug dealer, and he's like, you know it's illegal to buy these, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let me right. worry about that. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but well, if you like, put that on the ground, and I drop this money on the ground, then there was no sale, because I just happened <laughs> to find drugs. <laughs> right, exactly. I was always going to turn it into the correct authorities. <laughs> I just hadn't gotten there yet. They just beat me to it. 
Um, but he's like, but but Chauncey is the one bringing up the moral and ethical ramifications of your attitude. Of, he says, like, the moral and ethical ramifications of your attitudes are quite fascinating, Harry Dresden. I am continually amazed that you remain in the council's good graces, knowing full well that most of the council would look the other way while their enforcers killed you. Right? And so he's like, it's, it's, you, you kind of, you walk that line and you keep doing it knowing that there's no safety net kind of a thing. He's like, you really are kind of playing with fire and, and taunting the wrong people, and yet you continue on. And Harry's like, shit, shit's gotta get done, so whatever. Right? Well, that's another thing, like, is that crazy. you can't summon demons in the privacy and relative safety of your own home if you can't make the rent. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, a lot of Harry's walking of the line, you know, he's not you know, flashing Bob out in the middle of the streets of Chicago. He's not summoning demons in the middle of the streets no, of Chicago. He's not keeping an arsenal. Matter. That doesn't okay, matter to the council. Yeah, it kind of does, because Morgan doesn't know what's happening. But if Harry loses his house, and he's doing it in a tent in the middle of a park somewhere, Morgan's gonna walk up and be like, uh, bitch? Well, I mean, I guess partially, but... Um, and at this point, yeah, we don't really know what means the White Council does or doesn't have to keep tabs on Harry, you know? I mean, obviously we know they are, because he's like, every time I do a spell, more or less, I mean, I think there's a little bit of hyperbole there, but, you know, he's like, Morgan pops up and is like, what are you doing, you know? Um, so obviously, you know, yes, the privacy is at home, but we do learn again going through that, I mean, again, they're not omniscient, they're not all-powerful, they're not all-seeing either, like, exactly, Harry can't operate you know, within the confines of his own home and his own thresholds and things like that to a certain degree. But the point being is that, yes, if it's somehow... I mean, this is the thing I think Chauncey doesn't... Him or Harry make the... Well, we talk about the names, too, because he's like, they, they... Like, other people call up demons for information and stuff like that. I mean, again, it's not even so much they can't do it at all. It's Harry doing it, right? Because they're like, you know, you, you twitch an eyebrow the wrong way, we're going to chop off your head, right? So, um, Harry's doesn't really have the the slack or the grace or whatever that other people might be operating with normally. The point is, is that other people are calling up Chauncey and stuff like that too. So that's where he's like, if he's worried about his name getting spread around or passed on to the wrong people, they can also be like, oh yeah, I was just talking with Dresden. And then they'd be like, what? Dresden's calling up demons. Boom, let's kill him. So, I mean, it's sort of within the privacy of his own home, but there's ways of it getting out and getting around too. I think it's also another concern, too, that Chauncey can trade away Dresden's names. Yeah. Right. As easily as Dresden can give them up. He's got information to share for a price to somebody else as well. So, you know, let's say, for example, Marcone, who we've just dealt with, comes up to Chauncey and says, Hey, give me one of Dresden's name and I'll give you unlimited money for the rest of your life. You don't have to do anything, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. it's just a concern that, you know, is not considered as much as i mean like okay it's great and all that you're trying to keep people from being killed but this isn't really like you weren't being threatened up until you made the dumb decision to go to that warehouse it's uh the garage well, yeah yeah up until that point you know i feel like the stakes weren't worth the price that he's just paid and now a little bit he's like well i'm on the receiving end of death but it still seems like you know, uh, as with always, Harry doesn't think ten steps ahead at all. He doesn't even think two steps ahead. He's like, if I can avoid death today, screw the death tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't so much for his own, but he's looking at it whereas, right, where Murphy... I mean, he was there, he saw a spike, and we know that disturbed him a lot to see the damage that was done there. And then Murphy's like, oh yeah, this isn't the only one, right? So, in yes, as far as Harry's, but again, this is where Harry plays the hero and looks out for the little guy and takes care of Chicago and stuff like that, right? Marcone looks for what will benefit Marcone. Harry is like, how can I help everybody else, even if I cost me my own skin kind of a thing, right? So I agree. I think it's a little bit of like when you consider, you know, he's called him up a bunch of times and this is only the third time. It's like, it, it in some ways on the surface, it doesn't really seem like it seems I mean, like he's a high at price 50%. Because he doesn't know how useful this information is going to be yet. He doesn't know what the big connections are. But there's still like half a dozen people that are dead and big scary werewolves running around. So maybe to Harry that is worth. Okay, but look at it from this way. We know that there's been six visits and Harry's given up three names. Chauncey doesn't know how many names Harry has. And quite frankly, you know, as we know, Harry was named by his father, not his mother. And that his connection to the magical world was not through his father. 
So you would hope that a wizard is naming their children like 47 names so that they have a couple of, <laughs> you know, a bigger price tag to pay off in their wow, lifetime, right? Wow, he had a lot with having so like four names it, already. Well, I'm just Although saying I, it's it's very lucky that his father gave him as many as four names yeah. because, you know, the typical thing is generally three. And, you know, for Chauncey who maybe thought this was going to be the final ticket and then be like, oh, fuck, I'm not there yet. How many more names do we have to go? Like, Yeah, although I do like how you're bringing up that his dad, because he mentions that later on in the chapter, right, or whatever, that his dad gave him the name of these stage magicians that were, like, his hero. And he's like, I'm pretty sure if mom was alive, she would have killed him. <laughs> and, then you, and then bringing your point of view to it, it's like, she would have killed him because he only stopped, he stopped there. She's yeah, like, he stopped at four. <laughs> Surely you've heard of more magicians than that. <laughs> right? And of all. Uh, yes. So Chauncey admits to having the information that Dresden needs. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, oh yeah, by the way, totally know what's going on there. <laughs> and Dresden does give him the name mentioned. Yeah. So he finds out that, um, yeah, the dead businessman from Murphy's accounts of all the full moon killings um, is one James Harding III. And he's Marcone's business buddy and opposed... To this Harley McFinn person's Northwest Passage Project, which is a big, giant animal playground all across the northwest of the states and up into Canada. So go us. Yeah, and we don't really know a lot about it other than it's just this big, giant nature reserve kind of a thing for that, for wolves and, you know, All these people have else. lots of money. And wolf food. Yeah. And wolf food. yeah, wolves and wolf food. Um, whatever can survive in there. Until, so yeah, and, and Marcone and Harding and stuff like that are like, fuck that, this is like prime real estate. We don't want to have just a big giant bunch of land that nobody can do anything with and nobody can make any money off of and nobody can sell just so you can have a bunch of fuzzy things running around. Right? So that's why they're in opposition, right? They don't want all this prime real estate being... You don't understand, McFinn. If Alberta can't nothing. make money off of oil, they won't do anything. Right. Well, now we'd have to have a big animal preserve. I guess that's. I guess that's why it's uh, going to go through. It must be going through a uh, northwest, so through uh, B BC. Yeah, <laughs> a lot more tree huggers there. Alberta would never allow this. <laughs> <laughs> Saying Alberta would never go for this. You want a natural park for free? <laughs> yeah, because we have none here in Alberta. <laughs> wow, we're shutting oh. them all down. There you go. Um, yeah, okay. They're all charged. You have to pay uh, money to go to them. Well, that's true. Well, I'm sure you'd have to pay to go into this one, too. No, you just have to survive the wolves. Yeah. <laughs> you can make it out alive. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a badge. Okay, so he also jumps into the whole McFinn history, because Harry starts to make some connections here about, well, why would so-and-so McFinn care about so-and-so passage? And yeah. Uh, basically, basically makes the guess that McFinn is uh, a werewolf. Well, yes, <laughs> I'm. <laughs> I'm. I don't have my notes ready for which. Um, the Loop Guru. Is it the Loop Guru that this one is? Yeah, yeah that's uh, what I was McFinn gonna say. The Loop Guru. Okay. Chauncey, Chauncey leads Dresden to believe that McFinn had motive to kill James Harding the Third because of the opposition. Is basically. Mm -hmm. Where, where he tries to lead him to believe. Right. Or, so so Chauncey, Chauncey pretty quickly reveals how this loop guru came to be, which we know is a, a curse and a bloodline. Um, yep. Yeah. Legend uh, had a man known as St. Patrick cursed his ancestor to become a ravening beast at every full moon. The curse came with two addenda. First, that it would be hereditary, passing down to someone new each and every generation. And second, that the cursed line of the family would never, ever die out, lasting until the end of days. Okay, so, this whole Loop Guru thing. Uh, we brought it up a little bit uh, in the past about um, where the whole, like, werewolf Loop Guru mythology started. And we've got... Uh, for example, as, as it said here in the text, we've got St. Patrick's cursed an ancestor to forever um, have a born loop guru, one per generation, and that the bloodline can never, ever, ever die out. So McFinn is, either has or will have children or nephews 
or nieces somewhere. They've got to come up at some point. Somewhere in this family, you know, this problem will never be over for Harry unless he somehow manages to end the curse. I wonder if this curse gives him, like, wicked pheromones. Like, every woman around him is just like, oh, I must reproduce with you. Yeah, like, something like that. Like, it, like you will be a werewolf, but you're going to get laid. <laughs> at least once. At yeah. least once. <laughs> so, there's I'm not another... seeing the cons yet. <laughs> so far, it's, it's also a curse that you have to change every... Full moon, you'll change into this wolf. Um, it persists every generation, and supposedly the curse cannot be gotten rid of or die out. Um, we'll, you know, that's potentially something that can be changed by a better practitioner or whatever. It's said that St. Patrick's prayed to God and was like, yo, fuck these guys up. Or cursed by him. And then in the original tale, sorry, St. Patrick's prayed to God and was like, yo, fuck these guys up. They suck and I don't like them. Curse them. That was the original mythology is that St. Patrick's did not possess magic abilities. He just prayed to God and was like, I don't like these guys. They're being shitty. Curse them all to fuck. Oh. Um, right. He also, in the original mythology, didn't curse them on the full moon or until the ends of time. They were cursed for seven years or uh, they would take the f- form of a wolf every seventh winter oh. or were transformed into a wolf for seven years. Gotcha. Oh. So, in this one, obviously, it's um, not like that. It's every month on the full moon, which is a little bit more in line with more which modern is divisible day. divisible by seven. Does that count? Which sometimes sure. I feel like every month I turn into a wolf myself. But I'm bummed. Well, you know, I just shave once in a while. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> However, there is, there is another myth that we brought up earlier on that said that there was um, King Lycion who uh, was set to meet Lyceon, was set to meet with Zeus, um, but he didn't trust that it actually was Zeus. He wanted to see if he was being tricked or not. And so he kind of like princess and peed him and he fed him like a bunch of human flesh. And Zeus could tell that he was eating human flesh because he's almighty he's powerful Zeus. Zeus. And was like, all right, bitch. And cursed him and his whole family to basically all be wolves. So that was another um, loop guru starter myth. And as we learn in the series as we go on, um, we've got, I mean, it's not major spoilers, but we meet Hades and or Odin and or um, gods (laughs) to a certain extent. We meet Michael who does believe in God. We've we meet different factions of religion in one way or another. Yeah. And they exist in the world. So to have to say that Zeus is not a part of it in some capacity or another would be wrong. Gotcha. To say that St. Patrick's isn't a part of it in one way or another would be wrong. My point being is that I think that there is some werewolfy shit happening outside of McFinn. Just right. as a, an agenda. An amendment? Addendment? Ad- addendum? Addendum. One of those words. So you're just saying at this point, you think all of these killings are not just McFinn? That's not necessarily not McFinn, but that this is um, not necessarily a problem that is only McFinn? He might gotcha. be the only killer right now, but not forever. Okay, uh. I think I sort of gotcha. <laughs> So we, we, Chauncey also reveals that Marcone also could have had mo- motive to have had uh, Harding killed to broaden his financial empire if it wasn't uh, if it wasn't uh, McFinn. Yeah, because because he comes like that's the thing where they 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 get on this track and he says okay he's cursed and blah 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 and then um, Harry's kind of like all right it's making more sense like they um um. Harding and Marcone are against his his project thing, and he puts himself in the way. So McFinn kills him or whatever. Um, then he, and so he's like, so he's like, is McFinn the murderer? And and Chauncey, you know, gets technical here in that he's like, he's a murderer, uh, but I'm a human kind, you know, one of many kind of a thing. And he's like, okay, is he the one that killed? Like, what about the other people? And he's like, eh, inconclusive. And Harry's like, well, do you know who did it? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, okay, who? And he's like, uh, uh, uh not part of the deal. So, yeah, he's he's got 
yeah, like, basically, I mean, for once, Harry just basically straight up and is like, all right, is he our dude? And Chauncey's like, kind of, kind of not. <laughs> <laughs> you can't so tell the information straight out like that. That would just be not demon-like. Yeah, so it's kind of like, um, he, he, he slash, he, he can't slash, well, part of it is, is part of the deal. He's like, well, that's not, he's like, technically, he's like, also, you know, I can't just answer like a straight up, right? This is this whole beings from the never-never, fey creatures, demons, this whole, right, and this slightly different set of rules they play by that we haven't completely explored yet, but he's like, I, I can't just answer, like, a straight-up direct question like that for you, um, especially outside the scope of what our deal is. So he's like, both as far as payment and the natural laws of things, he's like, dude, you know better. <laughs> and he's like, eh, I had to go to shot. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, it's kind of interesting that that's sort of, um, it's, it's alluding to more lore and, and, and myth and legend and stuff there for how, how the rules of the universe work. Right. So Dresden gets the address, uh, 888 Ralston Place for, uh, for McFinn's residence. And he, and he pays Chauncey with a portion of his names as he promised to. Yeah. And it's just like, he's like, where, where do I find him? It's like, boom, he had like, like instantly hands him his home address. It's like, oh, well, okay. Not even like, well, he lives here in Chicago. Where he at? You know, he's like, boom, here's this guy's home address. And he's like, fuck, all right. It's refreshing, okay? I'm tired of these metaphors. <laughs> yeah, right. And he's like, oh, that I can answer directly. That's, oh, uh, you gotta love just like, not a, what, supernatural laws and capitalism. <laughs> he lives left of a birch tree next to a swan la- lake. Go out yeah. on a full moon and cover yourself in dog food. He will find you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right>. <laughs> <laughs> See many circles. Many circles. <laughs> no, just go out on a full moon and tell him you think his park's stupid. He'll find you. <laughs> um, lost, lost in a crowd. I hate parks. There he is. <laughs> Boom. Hey, you got your copy of your book out, right? Yeah. Okay, my copy says i think has a typo in it says my dad was a stage musician instead of a stage magician does yours uh i am looking i am looking i am mine also says musician i just noticed that now yeah i didn't read it earlier oh i've I've got i've i I don't have the physical copy i have the um ebook oh musician wow (laughs) Well, there we go. So I'll have to take a look at the physical copy to see if it says stage musician. Yeah, th- thought I'd mention that. Figures mom would. Oh, that was funny because he's like, I think if my mom had survived the birth, she would have slapped him. I'm like, if your mom had survived the birth, your dad might not have gotten to choose for an <laughs> She might have had something to say about that. I don't know. Stories like that are always kind of fun to me, too, because I was like, most of us, like, really think ahead and, like... Literally, plan. like, you never had a conversation the entire time leading up to it. Like, on what you were going to name this kid? Or dad yeah, was just like, like, well, here's my chance. I get it. Literally, <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> fuck that idea she had earlier. <laughs> I'm not going to name him Percy. What the fuck is Percy? <laughs> a strong and noble name. How dare you? <laughs> uh, it depends who's got it. But anyways, yes. So, um, yeah, I just, I thought that was funny. But yeah. So, yes, he gets, so, oh, so, now here, here is where Chauncey drops his big bombshell. Hook, line, and sinker. Yeah, and he's like, he's like, oh, my mom or whatever. Yeah, so he's like, I think she would have slapped him. He's like, indeed, he's like, your mother was the most direct and willful woman. Her loss was a great sadness to all of us. And and Harry's like, what, 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 Uh what, wait, what? You, 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 you knew, you knew my mother? He's like. And we get her full name here. Thank you, Margaret Gwendolyn Dresden. And because uh, she traded yeah, all her like, names oh, yeah, for we go uh, way back, because <laughs> huh? she traded all her names as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, okay, he didn't have to get them specifically from. But it's, yes. it's a different thing from knowing someone's name and having their name. How they say it, how they uh-huh. pronounce it. How I mean, right? We can read a name in a book, but until you hear that person say it right so that's yeah Um, yeah he he really like twists a knife in trying to get that soul to he teases hard yeah many in the hear the sound of your mother's voice and know what it was like yeah poor boy 
Yeah. yeah. It's just her, brutal. Her coming was awaited with great anticipation. <laughs> and he's like, what are you talking about? So, yeah. So Harry's really kind of, like, one, he didn't know she had a dark past. That's a whole thing, right? So he's like, he kind of knew he got his magical, like, his literal wizarding magical side from her. His dad was just a stage illusionist. Um, um, but yeah, also, I mean, again, like, he was only, like, six or whatever when his dad died, uh, supposedly from an aneurysm, and his mother supposedly died in childbirth having him, right? So didn't know a whole lot, you know, who knows if dad knew any of this background and might have shared it, you know, had intentions of sharing it some of it with Harry when he was older. But again, six-year-old Harry had no idea his mom had a dark past. And again, assumed both of his parents died somewhat natural <laughs> causes, yeah. you know, childbirth. And, and then, and then Chauncey alludes to both of them being unnatural deaths. Yeah. It's a pretty br- brutal way to find that out. It's from a demon. That's pretty intriguing too, right? Because we kind of get, we're like, okay, because Harry's like, well, like, did I inherit enemies? Or like, my mother supposedly had this dark past. Apparently she didn't just die naturally. Like, are there like enemies and stuff lurking out there that I've inherited? Like that might, you know? Um, But again, so kind of, to me, makes a certain amount of sense. I could see Margaret having, right? Because she was of that world and apparently interacted with demons and underworld and you know, the Dark Prince was awaiting her coming and pissed that, you know, eventually she she sh- shaped up and got on the straight and narrow again or whatever. Um, but why about his dad? Right? Like, mm. is that just kind of like collateral damage? Or did dad know more about that world? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, it definitely, I think, raises an interesting question there of who, what, when, where, why would have reason to. And, and like six years later. Right. Well, Dresden. Well, they were on the road. Yeah, I know they were. We're waiting. Evading. Evading. Oh, you think that's why he was traveling around as a? Maybe not knowing, right? But maybe, maybe they couldn't be found. Oh, Mm -hmm. that's why it took six years to catch up with him, kind of a thing. Maybe they were going to take him out right away. To yeah, I don't write it. It raises definitely some some interesting questions and thoughts and theories yeah i mean when you're not laying down a renter's agreement or a mortgage or anything like that you know there's only so much information that a hotel could pass on okay but these are demon chauncey like friggin no saint patrick cursed yeah but we don't know who killed or did the unnatural deaths and what they had available to them Okay. okay well okay okay that way i suppose yes i was just thinking if it's an unnatural whatever i mean obviously it wasn't a bullet to the head so it makes you think something more supernatural and obviously supernatural beings seem well, to I have think unnatural to be anything that's not the inner body yes, getting I you guess, I which guess. would so, be yes. a bullet to the head okay which yes but ob- i mean okay but they have it down that he died of an aneurysm like harry was there when his dad died he like woke up one morning and dad didn't basically raise so i was like obviously it could have been anything i think that, that a six-year-old's memory is infallible i think if his dad was like axe murdered though Harry would be like, uh, it's not an aneurysm. <laughs> you know, that's all I'm saying. If is Harry it had, saw it I, at all. I'm thinking that it was possibly, like, obviously whatever it was, was able to be passed off as an aneurysm. It's just what the cause of it was now was not necessarily what Harry thought. That's all my point to that is, is that, yes, I... Anyways, right. that part is all kind of... But yes, it just raises both for us, obviously, and for Harry, right? It's just, I could see sort of the immediate connection on his mother's side, but kind of made me wonder that, like, well, where does Harry's dad fit into all that? Even knowing what I know now. Mm. You know, because we do learn little bits and pieces about his father. So it's just like, hmm. but yeah, that was that. Like, yeah, dressed in a Chapter 11, boom, dis- summoning demons and finding out crazy crap about his parents and just throwing a wrench into everything. <laughs> he dis- dispatches uh, Chauncey is in in the pop. Yeah, and he gets pissed. Yeah, he gets mad. And uh, while he's recovering his wits, Mur- Murphy calls him with none other than the 888 Ralston Street address. <laughs> well, shit. <laughs> we got another one. Yeah. yeah. Hangs up the phone and heads out right into the full moon. 
<laughs> da, da, da. Da, da, da. <laughs> so yes, it's a somewhat eventful chapter for Harry. Emotionally, at least. I mean, there's not a lot that happened in other ways, but get some information, get some some shocking news, and then gets called to the same address to go check out the latest murder. This concludes our episode 5.5, Not for Sale. You can find us online at freeflowrambling.com and mcanalys.ca. There are, we have links to our other podcasts, social media, and other fun tidbits. Please subscribe if you like what you're hearing and please consider supporting us through Patreon to keep the magic alive and see more content. We are Free Flow Rambling. Conjure at it by your own risk. <laughs> <laughs>